Good afternoon. I'm John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and the services can be found on our website at nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our speaker today is Nolan Johnson, who's an archeologist. Nolan is also on the staff of the Nebraska State Historical Society. The title of his topic today is What Remains? Archaeology at the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing Site, a historically salvaged road ranch. Please welcome Nolan Johnson. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks to John for introducing me. Like he said, we're going to talk about um, archaeological salvage at the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing Site. And before we get to that, we'll go through a little background. Um, the next slide here shows us, this is just a nice map, uh, a relief map of the, of the Oregon Trail. And you can see this part about right in here. That's where Nebraska is. And the site we're talking about was part of um, a greater trail system that um, helped connect east and west before railroads did that. We'll go to the next slide here. And here is a better map of um, tra the different trails in Nebraska. And as you can see here, excuse me there, here in eastern Nebraska, there are just a bevy of different trails that start from the Missouri River and press across west and all eventually end up following the Platte River here through most of the state. Today, we're talking about the Nebraska City Cutoff, which is this one here in bold. And that star right there is Lincoln, so you can see that it did go just south of town here. Um, some of these other trails is this is the Oregon Trail leading up from Independence, Missouri. This one here on the north side of the Platte is the Mormon Trail. Um, some of these other ones are known as the Oxbow Trail. And we'll zoom in here on the next slide to, again, of Nebraska. And this shows all these dots represent different trails related sites that are still evident in Nebraska, um, maybe archaeological sites or sometimes maybe some buildings still, still are around. But that big triangle right there, that is the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing site. And this site's over in extreme western Seward County, about four miles more or less northwest from the current town of Beaver Crossing. Now on the next slide here, we're going to zoom in to eastern Nebraska and again, it's just the same map, but you can see here's the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing site. And you can see that the Nebraska City Cutoff, which is the trail segment it was on, started over here at Nebraska City and went over to where the second Fort Kearney was located. And that was right about here. So we'll go to the next slide. And before we talk about Beaver Crossing, we're going to talk a little bit about um, just kind of general travel on these western trails. And uh, the western trail travel was a very significant period in, in our country's history and how just that they estimate that somewhere between 350 and 500,000 people traveled across Nebraska between the 1840s and into the 1870s. And today, specifically, we're interested in something I have call salvage on the trails. And um, during the research for this paper, I read a lot of firsthand accounts about kind of this dual mentality of people traveling on the trail. You read a lot of accounts of how um, when people first started out, they were in these huge wagons loaded down with all kinds of stuff, like plows and heavy mining equipment, maybe even grandma's um, heirloom bedroom set, just real heavy stuff that was not practical to take on the trail. And so as they would go off, they would just throw this stuff off the wagon to lighten their load so they could keep going. And uh, one of my favorite episodes I read about is that um, 
that one particular person on the trail came across what he called a mountain of rotting bacon that someone had tossed off their wagon because they had, they had brought all this bacon thinking they would eat it, and before they ever could eat it at all, it went bad. So they just tossed it in a pile beside of the trail. And that, that, those kind of things all happened pretty quickly as people started out on the trail. But now as people went farther on the trail, um, they used up stuff they had brought with. Um, they were farther and farther from known civilization, and resources became scarce. And that's the second half of what I call, it's called a dual mentality. And as people went on, they started to reuse anything they possibly could. And there's also lots of firsthand accounts of people coming across stuff that other wagon trains had discarded and reusing it in various ways so they could make their travel easier on the trail. And so we're, we're interested in how this, this mentality of using whatever you can find in, in many different ways to get by, how that translates to the archaeology of the Beaver Creek site. We'll go to the next slide. And as I said before, the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing site was on the Nebraska City Cutoff, and we'll talk a little bit about what exactly the Nebraska City Cutoff was. And now in 1846, um, the Army established the first Fort Kearney about where present-day Nebraska City is today. And this fort didn't last too long, only about a couple years. But even after Army abandoned the site, um, a lot of freighters and immigrants were using it as a starting out point to head west across Nebraska. And it became known as the Nebraska City Cutoff because the town of Nebraska City grew up around this point. And the, the Nebraska City Cutoff went from old Fort Kearney to new Fort Kearney, which kind of gets confusing. But so old, new Fort Kearney was out where Kearney, Nebraska is today, and that's where the Nebraska City Cutoff ran to. And now this, uh, this trail, saw, it says up there as it saw, it's a peak travel in 1857 and 1858. And now this, this was towards the tail end of the big waves of immigration we see when we think about travel on the trail. We think about huge wagon trains of hundreds of families moving west for a better life. And certainly some of those people would have passed by the Beaver Creek site. But more and more, as the 1860s wore on, and in, even into the very early 1870s, we saw a lot more of freighting. We saw a lot more um, big, heavy 10, 12-ton wagons pulled by you know, 10, 12 yoke oxen carrying all these goods out to the expanding military presence on the, on the plains. And one of the interesting things about the Nebraska City Cutoff is this guy right here. And this is a photo of a steam wagon. Now, in 1860, an entrepreneuring fellow in Nebraska City thought he would make a fleet of these steam wagons, and they would um, put horse and ox-drawn wagons out of, out of um, business. And the idea was you could hook you know, 10 or 12 fully loaded wagons behind this giant steam-powered monstrosity here and go across the plains. And even in, in preparation for the steam wagon's inaugural journey out of Nebraska City, this fellow had authorized the prairie to literally be plowed up. They plowed himself a road for several miles out of Nebraska City so the steam wagon would have a nice smooth track to go on. Well, the steam wagon left Nebraska City to much fanfare and promptly broke down about two miles outside of town. And that's where it sat. They never got it running again. And consequently, um, people would come picnic at the steam wagon, and eventually the metal was salvaged for other purposes. But on the upside, people thought, hey, we've got this nice plowed track. We can take our regular wagons out there, too. So this, this steam wagon episode really helped kind of cement the Nebraska City Cutoff as a good way to travel. And on the next side, we finally get here to the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing site. That's a bit of a mouthful. A lot of times we'll just refer to it as uh, Beaver Crossing. But this is a photo from 1866 that's in the collections here at the Nebraska State Historical Society of the Roland Reed Road Ranch. And that's this, this structure right I think my pointer died. That's okay. That's that structure right there. And you can see that 
you know, the guys working the ranch are all lined up out in front to get their picture taken. Now, uh, Beaver Cross, the road ranch in question here, operated from 1862 to 1871. And when they built this, this little settlement here, and we're not quite sure if it was, we know there was buildings on the east side and the west side of the creek, but you can see that there's kind of the one main structure, this guy right here, and then it looks like maybe a sod lean-to or some other fencing over there. So there was a pretty substantial little settlement going, and this was in fact the original town site of Beaver Crossing, Nebraska. Now there's a Beaver Crossing, Nebraska still to this day that's about four miles um, southeast of where this, this photo would have been taken. And we'll go on to the next slide here. And here's a picture out of, well, three years ago, or four, four years ago, at the Beaver Creek site. And this is on the west side of the creek. And what's interesting is even after 150 years, you can still see these um, five, you can see there's five parallel ruts that come up from the flood, this is the floodplain here, the Beaver Creek, and this is higher ground here. And these, these are, this is the trail rut. This is the Nebraska City cutoff right here that's still, it's never been destroyed by farming or other agriculture. And you can, it's easy to pick up in the photo because the vegetation is different. You can see how the stuff that's not in the trail has already gone to seed and the stuff down here is still green. And that's because uh, the what, hundreds and thousands of wagons that pass on the trail compact the soil so much that it changes its um, ability to hold water, so that makes the vegetation grow differently, which makes it easy for us because we can see it there. And now the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing site here existed for, like I said, nine years, and from 1862 to 1871. And in 1871, a little bit where Beaver Crossing is today, a man opened up a grist mill on the Blue River and the railroad was coming to that spot. So the postmaster, a man met by the name of Tinsdale, who operated the post office, saloon, general store, and what have you at Beaver Crossing, decided that he was going to move his town, name and all, to the new site for the access to the railroad and this grist mill. So that's how um, the town of Beaver Crossing ended up moving four miles. And Tinsdale operated on the west side of the creek here, which is where this picture was taken. And the Roland Reed Ranch, we know, was on the east side. And it's the Roland Reed Ranch that was the main focus of the excavation that I participated in in 2005 and 2006 for the UNL Field School. That's how this um, research came about. And now we'll go to the next slide here. And this is a picture on the east side of the creek and this is the entrance to the ford of Beaver Creek. You can see how it looks like a big U, but this U is how the wagons would move across to cross the creek. And now it's important to note that um, these historic trails weren't like modern day highways. Not everybody was on the exact same road. As people traveled on the trail, um, a lot of times they would shift over because the grass would get eaten or they didn't like following in people's dust all day or things became too muddy. But at this ford, you knew that everyone had to come right through here because this was the place to cross the Beaver Creek. And that's why the Roland Reed Ranch could operate here and the Tinsdale <laughs> one on the other side because they had basically a bottleneck for all the traffic had to come through. So that's how they operated. And now this road ranch, um, we know from some historic documents that they would have sold feed to the animals of the people moving the wagons. They also traded in uh, worn out animals for a fresh one at two, a two to one trade ratio, which is a pretty good deal, because then they would just turn the worn-out animals out on the grass, and then they'd have two new fresh ones in a couple weeks. 
And then another thing about why this was a good place to set up a business is that it's a, um, in 1862, there would have been trees right along, right along the river that, or the creek there, but there wouldn't have been lumber anywhere else. And in fact, the original um, survey of this area notes that the Beaver Creek here was one of the few um, places that had permanent water and trees in the whole area. So this was really an ideal spot in 1862 if you were going to set up a business to service people on the trail. And even today, when we were out there excavating, um, it was the creek bed is still um, just, it's almost like a beach. It's very sandy and gravelly. And you can imagine it would have been pretty easy to get your wagons across, especially in the summer when the water was only a couple inches deep. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is kind of an overview of the whole east side and west side of the site here. And you can see this is the Ford entrance right here that we were just looking at. This right here is where the house was. And this is the trail leading into the Ford. And then th those are the five ruts I was talking about, about how you can, it's easy to think about how um, hundreds of wagons pounding across the grass is going to tear it up. I mean, if it rains, it's going to be muddy. So you need different ways to get up this little in incline. And there's the Beaver Creek right in the middle there. And so our excavation was right here where this house was. And you can see how it's kind of, it's got its long side oriented towards the trail, just like a storefront would today, so you could show your wares to the people driving by. And even better, um, if you read about historic accounts of people on the trail, they would often cross, you know, even this little creek, they would wait to cross it first thing in the morning so they would camp a lot of times on the east side or the west side, depending on which way they were going. So they would just stay for the night, and then the people at the road ranch would have you know, access to sell them all sorts of stuff. OK, and we'll move on to the next slide here. And before uh, we started excavating, we looked at some historical documents that helped us kind of get our mind wrapped around what we might find at the Beaver Creek Trail Crossing site. And as I said before, there are um, county histories and town histories of Beaver Crossing that talk about, you know, the Roland Reed Ranch and the Tisdale Ranch and what kind of structures they were. And we know, for instance, that the first man to build a cabin at Beaver Crossing um, had wood, had, didn't use sod. He built it out of wood and had wood shingles. But we also know that unless he was there cutting all those wood shingles by himself, he had to ship those in over the trail, from probably from Nebraska City. And then uh, another thing we looked at is prevalent building styles. And we all think about building on the plains. We always think about sod houses. That's kind of the iconic image of early plains settlement. But Beaver Crossing was different because it was on a creek, so they did have access to some logs, but not necessarily um, finished lumber. That also would have been had to hauled in on the trail. And like I said, it says up there, more distant or uh, distance to more established settlements. You can imagine um, if you, it's pretty easy today to run down to Menards and load your pickup with a bunch of two by fours and drive home. But try doing that with a wagon and two horses and driving 80 miles <coughs> to the nearest town and going back. So using what was there was a big, was an important part of how people got by out here on the plains. So we'll move to the next slide. And another thing that happens before we started excavating is called geophysical survey. And geophysical survey are very are different techniques that allow us to kind of get a picture of what's under the ground before we ever start digging. And this is a picture from the east side of the creek bed. And this is a conductivity survey. Now, conductivity means that we use an electrical probe and we pass electrical current through the ground. And it measures how well the ground conducts the electricity. And you can see the different colors here going on. And this right here, these reds and blues, this is actually the trail. 
where the wagons would have rolled. So you can see how the soil compaction from all the wagons has radically changed the ground's ability to conduct electricity. This circle right here uh, we discovered was a well. And if you think back to that first picture of the beaver, of the Roland Reed Ranch, there was a well in front of the house. And then over here, we've sort of got, we got these four dots. Now, we were kind of disappointed when we did this because we were thinking that if people had built a structure and later abandoned it, you know, maybe they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have dug a basement necessarily, but they at least would have had some kind of foundation or a foundation trench or something in the ground so their building wouldn't fall down. But instead of having nice long linear features like there were walls or a foundation, all we get is these four blobs that, if you use your imagination, are kind of a square or a rectangle, which is the best we got over on that side. Now, on the next slide here, we'll jump to a magnetometer survey. Now, magnetometer measures the magnetic fields of the soil, so not just necessarily metal, but also different soils um, have different magnetic variables in them. And again, down here you can see the yellow down there in the lines, that's again the trail. So again, the compaction of the soil from all the wagon trains changes the magnetic gradient, which allows us, even though we could pretty clearly see it on the surface, places where the trail may have been um, eroded away or plowed, you could still, if you did some of this geophysical survey, you could still find more trail ruts. And again, if you look, this is the well right here. So you can definitely tell there was something going on there. And again, we've sort of got these blobs. You got three blobs here and not really one down here. But again, it sort of lines up with a square. So we, we were pretty much sure that the building was up there somewhere at this point. And then on the next slide, we jump to the side of the creek. And again, this is, again, magnetometer survey. And this is a really neat, I think this is a real neat shot, because you can see these red and blue um, kind of pairs. And the red um, is high, basically high difference in magnetom mag magnetic fields. And the blue would be a low pole magnetic field. And you can see how they're paired up. And if you remember the picture of those five ruts, you can see there's one there, one there, this one, two, three. You can see four of them really clearly. And then if you look closer, you can see how there's these red lines that lead from those ruts coming up, up the embankment, which is right here, and how they just wed off west. And you can see how they were kind of moving back together. So I think this is a real neat shot of how um, coming up the, the embankment out of the floodplain, traction is probably more important. So you were moving around more to get out of the mud and get in the better spots. But once you got up here on the flat ground, everybody sort of gravitated back together. And this, is, this direction is northwest. So you can see how they were headed off towards uh, New Fort Kearney. And I just think that's a, real neat, that's a real neat way we can tell sort of how things were back then without having to dig a whole bunch of holes everywhere. And here's the next slide. Now, next slide, we finally talked in here about the excavation we did. And all those squares are all the test units we dug on the east side of the creek. And I think it ended up being 72, more or less. It's been a while. But um, the outline there, that rectangle, is our best estimate. And we're pretty sure that's where the Roland Reed Ranch is, that building we looked at before. And you can see how. Um, Again, we sort of centered our excavation on those corners. And these corners were the corners that showed up on the conductivity and on the magnetometer survey. So that's sort of where we started our excavation. And then we tried to, like, we found this one, and we found this one. And then we tried to follow this wall. Like, we assumed there would be something we could follow in between the two corners. Well, it didn't, it didn't turn out that way. And when we started doing that, that's really when this salvage hypothesis, is, which is what um, my research at the site was all about. And we'll, to explain that briefly, um, instead of just 
abandoning the house when they moved. I think that they literally tore it apart and took everything with them to the new site of Beaver Crossing. I mean, ripped the logs out of the walls, pulled up any stones they used in the foundation. And this is because, as I said before, there's not a lot of trees out in 1870, Nebraska. I've been to this site. There, is, there are no stones anywhere you're going to use to build a foundation. There's no brick kilns if you want bricks for a chimney or even a fireplace. You know, there's no glass factories anywhere in the area. And that picture showed they did have pane glass windows. So I think the people at the time thought that, you know, it makes more sense to dismantle all this stuff and take it with us instead of leaving it here to rot. And now we'll talk about um, what we did find on the excavation and how that backs up this salvage hypothesis. And the next slide here, this is a shot of one of the cor those corners we were talking about. Um, this right here, this is about the best kind of structural feature we found. And it doesn't look like much, but at the time, we were all pretty excited. And basically what this is, is a big jumble of mortar and tiny limestone fragments and just other construction junk, some nails and stuff like that. But um, you can see how it sort of slopes off this way and then kind of, kind of moves up this way towards the south. And now how this fits into the salvage hypothesis if you use your imagination, you can imagine if there was stones or even logs mortared into the ground as the foundation right here, and they were pulling them out of the ground, you pull them up and then you drag them, <coughs> you drag them out of the hole, leaving behind the mortar as it falls off as you're dragging the log or, or stone across the ground. And we saw this pattern many times at the site. We'll go to the next slide and we'll see another example. Now this is what we thought was going to be um, the wall at the site. And you can, this right here is a, is a tiny chunk of limestone, um, probably a chinking stone. And a chinking stone would have just been mortared in between, either between um, the cut logs to make it weather tight or between larger stones for the foundation. And that guy is probably about three inches square, and that's one of the bigger stones we found at the site. And what you can see is just all this, all that white in the picture there is just mortar. And there was just mortar everywhere, but it was never very concentrated often, and it wasn't ever very thick. So it was like, again, it's like if you imagine um, taking the house apart, I mean, the mortar falls out between the logs and between the stones and just gets sort of spread about the site. And on the next slide here, this is just another example of this kind of just diffuse pattern of just chunks of mortar and little tiny chunks of limestone that really have no rhyme or reason to um, looking like they once held up a building. So we'll move, we'll move on to the next slide. And the next slide's a little different. Um, this orange feature right here is most likely, as I told you before, um, when people would come to the ford, they would often camp overnight so they could tackle crossing uh, first thing in the morning. So what we're probably looking at here is some cowpoke put their fire right on the ground here, and it burned the earth underneath and left this, you know, burned the earth and turned it this bright orange. And so that's just kind of neat evidence to let us know that people were at the site you know, maybe having a cook fire or, you know, even heat and water to take a bath or wash their clothes. But all that is long gone. But we do have this um, evidence left in the soil for us to look at. So we'll hit the next slide. And here's another example of this. Um, you can see kind of heavier chunks of mortar here. And again, it pulls up to the south and sort of peters out as it goes on. And we saw this time and time at the site. And the next the next slide here is again just the same kind of the same kind of just this little skin thin scatter of little mortar chunks and those are little tiny pieces of brick in there. And eventually we came this is how we came to the salvage hypothesis because 
all this mortar and all these chinking stones and all this just really fragmented brick, there must have, I mean, unless someone came out there and just scattered around all this tiny bits of stuff, there must have been a structure that all this stuff was holding together. And so you, we think that they took all the large uh, building materials with them and left behind just all these chunks. So now we're going to move to structural artifacts column, um, stones, mortar, brick, daub, um, nails or pane glass could be structural, not necessarily. And this is a piece of daub right up, well, they're both pieces of daub. And right here you can see um, wood grains that are still impressed in this daub. And now daub is just essentially clay um, used to smash between logs or boards to weatherproof a building. And you can tell that by these um, wood impressions that that was in fact the case. And this piece of daub is, is really, really smooth. And so if you imagine if you're squishing daub up between two boards, the one side up against the wood has got the wood impressions, and the other side that you're either using your hand or a trowel or a shovel is going to be smooth. So this is just some more evidence that at some point there was some kind of structure at the site, but the larger building materials aren't there anymore. And I think that they were, and that the evidence is pretty clear that they were salvaged by the people at the time. And the next slide, we got, this is a good picture too. This right here, this guy, that is the biggest stone we found at the site. He's about five inches wide by seven inches long. And uh, this is probably another <coughs> chinking stone. Um, it's just limestone that's covered in mortar. And like I said before, would have been used to hold or to fit in between larger stones. And again, it's just that there's all this evidence for this guy. And this is just another little tiny piece of limestone we found. And this is a big um, structural bolt, maybe used to hold um, the corner of a building together. You can see how it's broke off at that one end. And this bolt, um, it's bright red because when you burn these um, machine cut, or this might even be a hand forged uh, metal iron nail like that, the iron in there turns bright red. So we know this guy was burned at some point. And we'll hit the next slide here. And now we'll talk about um, a little bit about the, the distribution of these structural artifacts. And you can see um, all these shaded ones here are where we found mortar at the site. And you can see it's just spread, it's spread all over everywhere. And again, I think that this supports the salvage hypothesis because if you're tearing up the foundation and taking apart the walls and dragging them into a wagon, I mean, the mortar is going to continually fall off wherever you haul the things while you're dismantling your building. And on the other side here, we have um, where we found the daub that uh, had wood impressions or was had the flat side, so we're sure that it was involved in building construction. And this is a little, there's not as much as that because daub doesn't preserve nearly as well because daub is essentially just burned, burned clay. But you can see um, the one corner of the building was there and the one was there and another one was down here. So again, you got to you figure that um, a corner of the building is going to be the sub more substantial because it's where two walls meet as opposed to just the middle of a wall. So it makes sense that we would find daub at the corners of the building. And the next slide here is where we found brick. And those guys right there are the biggest uh, brick fragments we found. And they're, the biggest one here is about two inches this way and about an inch and a half this way. And again, if you think about salvaging a building and you want to reuse the bricks, you're going to end up chipping them apart with whatever tools you have to get the bricks out. And you're going to leave these tiny pieces that you, sm you chipped off, and you're not going to pick these up. And again, if you look at where we found brick, and the darker the shading is, that's where we found more brick. And again, you've got one corner there, one corner over here, and one corner over there. So again, if the 
corner of the building is more substantial, it makes sense that you find more of these brick fragments there. And the next slide, we'll, we got, we'll move on to nails here. And obviously, the, we found lots and lots and lots of nails at the site. And 80% uh, of the nails at the site were either bent, like that guy right there, or just busted, these fragments. These guys are all broken. And again, I think that leads, leads credence to the salvage hypothesis, because if you're pulling boards off of walls or pulling walls apart, you're going to bend the nails and you're going to break the nails. And interesting, um, at the site we found lots and lots of like four and six penny nails and not very many um, bigger nails, 12 or 16 penny, that would have been used for more structural framing. And maybe that's because the bigger nails are easier to find when you're picking up after you're done deconstructing so you can take them with and use them again. Or another way to think about it is if that the bigger nails are harder to get out of the wood, so maybe you just leave them in there and move on like that. And uh, the next slide here shows us the distribution of, of the nails. And again, you can see how there are nails almost throughout the whole site. But again, we have that same pattern of where more nails are at these sort of these three major corners that we found at the site. So, and then over here we have uh, the distribution of pane glass shirts. Now, pane glass is just the word we use for flat glass to differentiate it from bo bottle glass. And again, you can see that um, the glass is kind of spread out throughout the whole site. But again, more of them are around, like if the building is this rectangle here, more of it is sort of around the building. And um, one of the fel my fellow students did a study on the pane glass. And by the thickness of the pane glass, you can kind of get a rough estimate on what year it was made. And so we think that at least three times the people at the Roland Reed Ranch had to replace their windows. So apparently there were kids with rocks even then. <laughs> but, and then I think that when they, find, when they were moving the town site, you're not going to break the windows as you go. You're going to do your best to take, take the complete panes with you. And again, the size of these pane glass shirts we found were all very, very tiny and very, very small. Nothing like a whole pane of glass somebody had just left at the site. So we'll move, we'll move to the next slide. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit here quick about uh, other artifact classes. And these are just some fragments of bottle glass from the site, or container glass, not necessarily bottles. Could have been bowls or dishes or anything like that. And um, the bottle glass was also very fragmented. We didn't find um, anything near a complete bottle. And uh, that could be because in the 1870, 71, when the site was moved, Glass bottles were kind of an important commodity. Um, people would reuse them for all, all kinds of stuff. And we were able to identify um, two, two bottles as um, Kelly's, I wrote this down, let me get it right, Kelly's Old Cabin Bitters and St. Drake's Plantation Bitters. And bitters is a fancy term for what they called medicine, which was essentially booze and laudanum mixed together. <laughs> but it's kind of an interesting window into the 1870s on the trail that maybe sitting out in front of your wagon slugging on whiskey was not really acceptable. But if you say, oh, my head hurts, I better drink some bitters, <laughs> people would let that go, which is just a neat little segue there. But again, um, the bottle glass, all very fragmented, um, very tiny, tiny things. Again, sort of goes along with our salvage hypothesis. And we'll move to the next slide here. And we'll talk a little bit about ceramics at the site. And the ceramics at the site can be divided into two, kind of two groups. And uh, this is sort of the, th these are examples of the first group. This is a transfer print, this lovely blue pattern. And um, I think that these, sort of the fancier ceramics were what maybe the Roland Reed family used in their house for their family. And uh, on the next slide, we'll look at some, 
a example of a, a coarse earthenware jug. So I think they had <coughs> what passed for fancy china for themselves inside, and then for the cowboys driving the wagons, they had you know rough and tumble stoneware crocks and things. But we'll talk. Let's talk about this guy a little bit. This is a real interesting piece. This, all these numbers and letters and stuff. If you know what you're looking at, this is an English registry mark, and on the other side of this plate is an embossed design called Berlin Swirl. And this this little diamond of, of hot you know stuff tells us that um, in December 18, 1856, in England, someone registered the patent for Berlin Swirl. So what that tells us as archaeologists that there's no way that plate could have been at Beaver Crossing before 1856. And you've got to figure that, you know, if the pattern's registered in England, it's going to take a while to get to America and get across the plains. So the late 1860s, 1870s, that makes sense spatially. And that's corroborated by this guy right here. It says, manufactured for and imported by Chauncey Philly of St. Louis, Missouri. And St. Louis, Missouri, at the time was second only to uh, New York City as terms of tonnage of a port. A, a lot of the goods that were shipped out west were shipped into St. Louis and then either taken by steamboat up into Nebraska and across, for instance, the Nebraska City Cutoff, or taken from St. Louis by wagon train. And we'll look at the next slide here. And uh, that top one is a fancy hand-painted um, whiteware piece. Again, sort of the fancy indoor wear for the Reed family, maybe. And this guy is what the bottom and sidewall of a big stoneware jug. And you can imagine serving water or you know stew, or if it's a crock, you know making food or whatever to serve people on the trail, because you'd care less. Or you you probably care, but it would be less important if this got broke than your fancy hand paint in China. And again, the ceramics at the site were all very fragmented and broke up. So obviously when you move, you pack your dishes, but if you break a dish when you're moving, you throw it in the garbage. So again, that sort of supports our salvage hypothesis. Now the next slide, we've got buttons. And now buttons don't really tell us a whole lot about um, salvage, but they are fun. And um, they do provide an interesting look at the different people that would have been at the Roland Reed Ranch. Um, these top two are military buttons. That's a rifle regiment button off a coat. And this, you can't, this one's hard to see, but this is actually a naval button. Somewhere there's an anchor in here. It's hard to see. So you've got you know, army guy, army men, um, had some fella who was in the Navy, maybe kept his coat when he left and was heading west for a better life. And then this one is a fancy uh, ceramic button with these lovely blue stars put in it. And you can imagine this on um, a lady's dress or even we found a lot of shoe buttons. They didn't have shoelaces at the time. People buttoned their shoes. so. This is just an interesting way to think of kind of the cross-section of the people that were traveling on the trail. In the next slide, this is a fun one. Um, you can't really tell what well, it says. It's a boot heel. This is a leather uh, boot heel. And we found this in what we think is the trash pit that would have been behind the house. And it's interesting to note that the trash pit, you wouldn't have been able to see it from the trail coming up to the ford. So like any good store owners, you throw your trash out where your customers don't see it. And uh, this boot was preserved because there was lots of ash in the trash pit, and they were burning their garbage, I imagine. And so the, the ash made the soil real acidic, which helped preserve this, this guy, this boot heel, which is kind of fun. And the next slide, we've got a couple pictures of um, some faunal remains we found at the site. And we found um, domestic and wild animals. So again, we have that mentality of you know, using what's around. These people weren't so flush with cash and animals that they weren't about um, shooting deer or even uh, we found a nice beaver skull at Beaver Creek, which is <laughs> appropriate. But I think these ones are, are from a pig. And you can definitely see how they were cut just flat. Someone had butchered this 
and just sawing right through the bone to get the cuts of meat they wanted. So next, the final thing we'll talk about here quickly, and I'll have to run through it pretty fast here, is um, the stratigraphy of the site. Now, stratigraphy was a big part of kind of cementing the salvage hypothesis. And stratigraphy is a fancy word for kind of the layering of the site. And uh, there's a thing called a Harris matrix, which is just a way of representing in a diagram the layers at the site. And the Harris matrix is based on these four mm -hmm. laws. And we'll go over them real quick, real quick. The law of supervisition just means that if you're looking at sediment or you know, human occupation layers, if they're undisturbed, the one on top is younger than the one on the bottom. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And the law of original horizontality, um, and these first three are borrowed from geology. Now this means that sediments in a basin um, are laid down pretty much horizontally flat. And uh, people, um, humans interrupt this by building walls and vertical, ver um, vertical basins or vertical walls that interrupt the original horizontality. And original continuity, that just means that if you um, have a sediment layer or a human occupation zone, they tend to thin out from the central consistency. And it's the best way to think of it is, um, for instance, if you have a, a creek or a river that floods, the farther you get from the river, the sediment that's deposited is going to get thinner and thinner and thinner until finally there isn't any anymore. And the law of stratigraphic succession there um, means that's a specific law for archaeology, and that just means that uh, humans basically disrupt these other three laws with their activities. And again, the Harris matrix is just a way to visually represent the stratigraphy at a site. And we'll jump to this one. This is a Harris matrix um, I made for one of the test units. And what's important. It looks just like circles and squares, but what's important to look at is that this top guy here is the soil layer, and this, this test unit only had one sediment layer, but it had all these features. So basically all the human activity in this unit was all bounded by this one soil layer, and then you know this, this feature was higher, so it happened after this feature. And that's all, it's pretty simplistic at this site. The one on the left is a site that's got way more going on. But at Beaver Creek, it was just, it was pretty simple. So there's that guy right there. And then artifact matrix is something, a term I made up to talk about the artifacts at the site. And now, we didn't talk about it, but real quickly, there were prehistoric artifacts from maybe uh, 150, 250 years before the white settlers came, there were some Native Americans utilizing the site. Mm -hmm. And now the interesting thing at the site is that all the historic and prehistoric artifacts were all mixed together. In every level, um, every soil level, every level we excavated, um, the features at the site, these both types of artifacts that were separated by you know, at least 150 years in time were all mixed together in the same, the same soil. And now this is, I found this to be pretty convincing evidence for the salvage hypothesis because um, if the Native American artifacts are just laying in the soil and the Euro-Americans come and they dig their foundations, they dig in and they disturb them. And then when they're done, they, when they're done salvaging, they dig in again to get at the stuff they already put in the ground for the jumbling both sets even more. And these pictures are just a way to represent that, um, like this one, this was one test unit. And there, this guy, this represents a feature, and this is the soil level the feature was in. And you can see that um, both historic and prehistoric artifacts were in both the feature and the soil layer. And it's the same on the other side. Um, the bottom sediment layer was sterile. We didn't find either uh, prehistoric or historic artifacts. But again, we found these two features or excuse me, the historic and prehistoric artifacts were in each, were in the levels there. And time matrix, again, is this is something that I made up to talk about at the site. And 
real quickly. The thing to remember is that this is a matrix for, uh, again, that same test unit where it only had one soil level. We need to think about that all these human activities, each of these features represents a different human activity at the site. They were all took place um, during, the, during the time that it took for this sediment layer to be laid down. So it's interesting to think about how the time of the sediment helps bound the human activity at the site. So to wrap it up here, just some conclusions. Um, the, uh, the investigation of the site, uh, the geophysical, the historical documents, and the excavation, and the interpretation of the artifacts, um, we came up with the salvage hypothesis. We really think that the people, when they were moving the town site to take advantage of the new um, economic opportunities of the railroad and the grist mill, they decided, hey, we don't have a lot of building materials here. Why don't we just take everything we can and move it down the road? to the new town. And for future archaeologists, um, it's important to, the, a site like this offers interesting and unique opportunities because it doesn't just tell you about the daily activities that happened at the site. It also um, gives you an, a window to the minds of the people on what they were salvaging, why they were salvaging, what was important to them, what they left behind. And just one thing to remember, Disturbance isn't a bad, necessarily a bad thing. A lot of times in archaeology, if we talk about things being disturbed, that means we've kind of written them off and they're not important. And an interesting side note, um, in the park at Beaver Creek, there is a grinding wheel um, supposedly from the grist mill that put the Beaver Creek Trail crossing site out of business. So if you're ever in the town of Beaver Crossing, you can go to the park and check that out. And finally, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Paul Demers, uh, was my thesis chair. The Midwest Archaeological Center, they did a lot of the geophysical stuff. Um, Richard Parasette and family, he was the landowner who was gracious enough to let us camp out and dig up his pasture for two years. Uh, the Nebraska State Historical Society. And finally, all the students who helped um, in the 2005-2006 UNL Field School. And now I think we got, we got a little time for questions, if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You in the back. Yeah, um, when you reach all those original uh, four or five tracks of where the uh, wagons went through, you can still see that. Yeah, we can. And stuff. Yeah. That's on private land now. Is yeah. there some type of uh, uh, conservation where they can't go in and, and uh, disturb that? No. Um, the only reason this is preserved is because um, <clears throat> Mr. Paris that is kind enough not to plow this up now. Um, the laws in the United States put private ownership at a premium. So in theory, if he wanted to go out with his tractor and bulldoze those all in because it's too rough to drive up, he could. Yeah, ma'am? Were you able to establish the approximate uh, dimensions of the structure? Yeah. Um, Roughly, it was about 20 by 30, maybe. Just not, not real big, not super big. And um, we can go, yeah, we'll go back real quick. But there were, um, you can, but it would have been one and a half story, so there's probably a sleeping loft up here with this window on top. And then you sort of, that's a sod roof, it's hard to see. So there was some sort of outbuilding you know, going up, maybe for blacksmithing or cooking or something outside going on out there. Yeah. What prehistoric artifacts did you find? Sure, we found um, uh, prehistoric pottery, lots of um, chip stone from them making their tools, uh, arrowheads, uh, scrapers, various other um, uh, stone tools, <coughs> and some fire cracked rock, which is just means that rock that had been around a campfire used for stone boiling stuff. And like I said, it probably would have been, it probably lower loop was the cultural phase from 1500 to 1750, more or less. Yeah. Has anybody looked for, like, there's like three ranches on the cutoff in Lancaster. Has anybody looked for those three? There's one like on Salt Creek. Yeah, um, 
There's one by... East and West Florida is supposed to have one. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Demers is actually... he's con My work with the trails kind of stopped when I graduated, but Dr. Demers has continued to be interested in trails in Nebraska, and he's been out investigating. I know one out by Denton, for sure. He's been out and checked that out. And then there's one by Donovan, too. That's a little... that's farther west. Is there anyone, any other questions? Yeah. You can see from the picture that it's pretty good sized chunks of log. Yeah. Are there any buildings you'd be ever crossing when that log would have been reused? Is that evidence that it would have been down and used? Nothing that's that still there today, but I imagine, yeah, they would have, because you can see these are they're, they're squared logs and then it's, you know, lumber on top. I imagine the owners would have took this apart and then, you know, reconstructed it at the new at the new town. Because that's how I envision it at any rate. Well, I think that's about it for today. Thank everyone for coming and I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Thank you.